I didn't think somebody was going to be able to answer my questions. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to waste his time. But the other thing I appreciated um, very early was that it felt like give and take. So I would not have been as interested in those conversations if it felt like, you know, he was teaching me, but I, there, I wasn't giving back anything in return. Oh, yeah. Hello, and thanks for joining in. I'm Jana Harmon, and you're listening to the Side B Podcast, where we see how skeptics flip the record of their lives from atheism or skepticism to belief in God. It's often thought that belief in science excludes belief in God, that somehow they are not reconcilable, that one cannot be a serious student of science and be a serious believer in God. After all, Richard Dawkins once said, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Many atheist thinkers over the decades have touted the story of atheism as the courageous scientific progress of man overcoming primitive superstitions and make-believe gods, that we no longer need a god of the gaps hypothesis to explain what we are now seeing in the world and through science. But what happens when someone takes science extremely seriously, particularly evolutionary biology, yet is questioning the need for or reality of a transcendent being beyond the natural universe? Has Darwin definitively ruled out the possibility of God, as Dawkins suggests, or is it still possible to believe in God and evolution at the same time, as Christian philosopher Alvin Plantinga and others contend that evolution does not necessarily disprove the existence of God. The former atheist in our story today, Dr. Don Simon, holds a PhD from the University of Iowa in evolutionary biology and has published a number of peer-reviewed professional articles in these sciences and is a professor at the University of Nebraska. Along with Don, we'll also be talking today with Tim Stratton, someone who was quite influential in engaging Don on the issues of science and belief in a thoughtfully challenging, intelligent, and humble way. This should prove to be an intriguing story. I hope you'll join in. Welcome to the Side B Podcast, Don and Tim. It's so great to have you both with me today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Wonderful. Well, as we're getting started, I'd like for our listeners to know just a little bit about you both. So we're going to introduce uh, both of you one at a time. Dawn, why don't you tell me a little bit about who you are now, and, a little, and then we'll get back into your story after Tim introduces himself. So my name is Dawn Simon. I am a professor of biology. My specialty is actually molecular evolutionary biology, and I am at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. And Tim? Yeah, uh, my name is Tim Stratton. Uh, I'm a, a professor at Trinity Theological Seminary and College of the Bible, teaching apologetics and theology. I run a ministry called Free Thinking Ministries. Uh, people can find me on YouTube under that name and also uh, find my website, freethinkingministries.com. And uh, yeah, I just have a passion for uh, apologetics and theology and uh, evangelism. And I think you'll see some of that today. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, for those of you who are listening, we'll put those sites and links in our episode notes. So let's get started with your story, Don. Um, take me back to where you're from, where you grew up. Talk to me about your family. Uh, was religion or God a part of your world growing up? So I grew up in a small town in eastern Iowa, so heavily Catholic. So we were a town of about 2,000 people, and we had two churches in town, both Catholic. Um, and my uh, from very large extended family. So my mom has um, is a family of 12, and my dad is a family of 11. Everybody's Catholic. Um, <laughs> my, my grandparents were um, definitely observant and many of my relatives were as well. Um, my parents were not particularly, uh, though I did go to Catholic school and I went through all the sacraments um, associated with that. 
Um, I would say while I knew, like I could, I could win Bible trivia um, and I knew the rules, I, I don't think I ever was a believer. Even mm-hmm. though if you would have asked me as a third grader, you know, do you believe in God? I probably would have said yes, because that was the right answer. That's the answer I was supposed to give. Um, my parents, we, we just didn't talk about it ever. So in general, in my family, like those kinds of ideas or beliefs about a higher being is personal. They're not things to talk about. You believed or you didn't, but you kept it to yourself. And so I can distinctly remember having some questions <laughs> at a young age. Um, I had this children's Bible that had like a picture and then one story per page that my grandma gave me um, like for my first communion. And I liked it. I mean, I liked the stories. And I definitely had the distinct impression that you just don't ask questions. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so you were growing up in a, a Catholic world, I guess, nominally Catholic, it sounds yes. like. You went through the motions. It was more ritual and yes. perhaps rules. You were in a Catholic yes. school. But you're also telling me you were, even as a young, chi- young child, you were inquisitive. You were uh, what I would consider a critical thinker or even introspective or, or really thinking about the books and the and the beliefs that you were asked to believe. And, and you weren't exactly buying it. Sounds right. like you were pushing back at an early age. Uh, that tells me a bit about you. So you went through Catholic school, uh, elementary school. Through did you did you go through middle school and high school? No, our town only had Catholic school through elementary school, and then I transferred to public school. But we still had um, what was called release time religion class, where you would leave in the middle of the day, cross the parking lot go to religion class in a building across the parking lot. Um, And so I did that until I made my confirmation, I think in 10th or 11th grade. Okay. I wasn't at a Catholic school, but was still doing the um, release time religion classes. So I'm I'm curious uh, at that time where you were actually confirmed in the Catholic church, how were you feeling and thinking about that? Were you buying into it at that moment? Point, or were you feeling a bit conflicted about even going through the motions of that kind no, of sacrament? I, mean, I I wasn't conflicted in the sense that, I mean, it never really had a deeper meaning. It was just like a thing we were supposed to do. And so like you had, I remember that there was questions, like you had to pass some test, I think. I don't know, like the, the bishop asked you questions and you know, it was very nerve wracking to whether you're gonna get the right answers. Um, and so I was really focused on just that. It was just like a thing to pass. And so I never thought too much about deeper meaning. I had some, I mean, I was conflicted in the sense that I remember, I don't remember it with confirmation, but around that same time, I really thought I didn't believe in God. Okay. And I had asked my mom, you know, I remember saying to her, I don't think, you know, I don't think I believe in God. And it was super hard for me to say, um, because I knew that was bad. Um, and it, yeah, it made me feel like a bad person. And she, she didn't have a thing to say about it. So she um, had no response, no, no, no even like nothing. what I you think nothing. Because I remember, because we have a, um, a co- my mom's cousin is a priest. And I remember thinking, or I don't know if I said it to her, but I was hoping that's what she was going to say is like, you could talk to him. Um, but it, it didn't, that didn't happen. So did you ever think, well, perhaps I should go talk to the priest? And, and- I thought I should, but it was too scary to do it because it was, um, I wasn't supposed to think that, you know, so it was bad. And I didn't, um, and I thought it made me a bad person. So I wasn't going to to do that. I mean, I confided in my mom and it wasn't like she disapproved. She just didn't, she just didn't have anything to say in response, you know? So yeah. yeah. And that's kind of how my parents are in general, you know, that they'll, they'll support me. Um, but it's up to me to figure it out. Mm. Well, I think it was really quite courageous for you to reveal that to your parents. Uh, but I hear you when it when you say that it sounds like there wasn't a real safe place for you to go outside of your home to ask the the bigger questions. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you, so you, did you take on the identity of an atheist then, or, or is that something that came later? No. Or talk so with that, me. Yeah. I was really reluctant to call myself that, um, for always. I never got over the reluctance to, to say that I was an atheist. Well, and one thing was I had learned very early, I mean, and I don't even know if this definition is right, but what I had learned was that an atheist is that you know for sure there isn't God. An agnostic is you're not sure. And so I'm not sure about anything. And so I thought I thought being an atheist, I thought, I mean, I really thought who would who would who would say that? You know, certainly not me, because I'm again not sure. You know, I might be ninety nine percent sure. Mm-hmm. But to me, in my mind, atheist was, you're 100% sure there isn't a God. And for me, I think I was always hoping there was. I didn't see any evidence for it. I thought that was probably wishful thinking um, on my part. Um, And so I would have said I was agnostic, but I didn't think there was a God. Um, You know, I, I just wasn't sure. And so that was, that actually never really changed even though by most definitions, I think people would have would call themselves an atheist. It's just that because I wasn't 100% sure there was no God, I wasn't willing to take on that label. Um, and so that never that never went away. I mean, and I tried, like I tried to do things. I remember like in college and graduate school, I started going to church, um, Catholic church. I mean, I went most weeks. Um, I mean, it was something to do and I could say I was trying, but it didn't um, do anything for me internally. Like nothing about me changed as part of that experience. Well, growing up, the only thing I knew to do was to go to church in terms of like trying to have faith or trying to believe in God. That was the only thing open to me, I thought. And so I tried that and um, I, it didn't, that didn't, didn't work for me. You know, and again, I think that really speaks to who you are, Dawn, and your and your desire for intellectual honesty and integrity. You know, because I think a lot of people will just take on the the identity of atheist and really not think what that means. Like you said, you defined that in order to be a credible atheist, you are to call yourself that you really have to know everything about all of reality. Yeah. And right. and you right. you understood that. And um, so to be that self-limiting, again, speaks to your your integrity um, and your desire, not only, again, to just to, to be sure, but you, you're also honest in the fact that, that you're continually skeptic, st- right. skeptical um, because you, you're constantly searching for the truth. And, and that is something that I think all, uh, all of us can take a cue from is really continuing to search for truth. So as as you're moving along, you have this interesting kind of oxymoron that you're telling me. It's like you you want to believe, you just can't because it's not right. intellectually credible to you. But yet you're going through the motions of church, but that doesn't, you know, it's just more a social outing, it sounds like, for you more than anything. So that was college, and you pursued a, a degree in biology. in biology. So you were heavily immersed in the sciences at that time. Yes. I would imagine that your naturalistic worldview, that worldview without God, was being reinforced through your study of the sciences. Were you were you attending to any of that as how it related to the existence or not of God? I mean, truthfully, that didn't um, it didn't play as much of a role as people think. Um, I I mean, I specifically remember in grad school having this conversation with with another person. If he wasn't an atheist, he was like me, agnostic leaning atheist. And he was, we're both in the lab. And I said, I remember saying to him, you know, people that think we have it all figured out don't know anything about what we do. Like, (laughs) I just remember saying, like, there's plenty of places for supernatural. Um, I mean, not that I would be able to say exactly what those places were, but there's so much unknown. And so I just remember having this kind of discussion. He was kind of philosophically minded. And we were having this discussion about kind of, um, you know, the debate between sort of intelligent design or creationism and then 
a naturalistic worldview. And and we both thought that there was room to be a believer and an evolutionary biologist. Okay. Um, and so even though I was not in that category, um, I didn't see contradict inherent contradictions in general. Maybe specific claims, yes, but you know, in general, I thought you know it's it isn't as if we have things all figured out. We have like one percent of things figured out. You know, so I mean, it, it's arrogant to claim that we don't need anything else. I mean, you know, and I I was, um, yeah, agnostic on it, whether we needed a supernatural being or not, but I knew there was plenty of unknown. Yeah, I appreciate your, your humility there, um, kind of a modest epistemology, if you will, that uh, you understand our limitations of where we are now, and there's just so much that we don't know. But we we uh, we are always looking to make the best explanation of the things that we do know, right? And experience. Right. So, you were you were moving along, and I I'm curious too. Before we move too too far, in embracing this agnostic atheistic leaning direction, as a critical thinker that you were, were you looking at, at the implications of that godless worldview and what it meant for you in terms of? Your life, meaning, purpose, um, well, direction, was, any of that? Was, you know, so I wasn't thinking like that exactly. I mean, I definitely, it definitely felt empty um, without God. Um, but I wasn't thinking in terms of like bigger picture, like what, what is life without God like because that's what life was for me so mm-hmm. you know so i didn't have to think like what would it be if there was no god because i already thought there was no god and so i knew what that felt like um and you know and and again i would have to put that into like, mystery category you know why do we continue to do anything at all i don't know um but there's a desire to, to do so even if there's no impl- implications later, there still, you know, is inherent kind of driving force to do good, be good. Um, but I wasn't thinking about that in a philosophical sense. I mean, just kind of one foot in front of the other, you know, I mean, keep moving forward kind of thing. I mean, and I was struggling. It's not as if I was comfortable with that idea. Um, I was struggling and I remember there was a, podcast actually this was during my postdoc so after you finish your phd scientists often do additional training called the postdoctoral fellowship and so i was in canada doing my postdoc and i heard this podcast about how somebody lost their faith and they grew up and it was it felt very similar to me like they grew up in a catholic home and she talked about like her brother dying and what that meant and I just thought, well, this is it. You know, this is this is really what I think. And I, you know, finally, finally admit it. I wasn't happy about it at all. It was like a punch in the gut. You know, that I was, that I, yeah, that I just thought, you know, I've been trying really hard not to come to this conclusion, but that's what I actually really think. And so that's when, like, Kind of like in during my postdoc years was when I started, if not to other people, admitting to myself that I didn't think there was a God. So you were finally closing that door. Um, and so what happened next in your journey? So I got this job, <laughs> the job I currently have in Kearney, Nebraska. Um, and I came here and I, this was a place different from any other place I had lived. So just in general, people are super friendly. Um, I'm also an introvert, so I didn't always, always appreciate that. Um, I mean, I appreciated the sentiment, but I did not appreciate, you know, needing to talk to people all the time or people like clear across the street waving 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 that you don't even know you don't know that you don't know that you know and they want to say hello so like extremely friendly helpful community and then the second thing is like very open about religious beliefs and i oh that 
I really didn't like that part. Um, so, you know, for example, like at the dentist's office, they're playing religious music. For the coffee shop, there's Bibles on the table. And, you know, just these, I just felt like it was everywhere. And people are so comfortable and so open with their faith. And I, and I didn't find it pushy in the sense that it wasn't like, people treated me different or were always trying to talk to me about it, but there was just like evidence of it everywhere. And so I had this thing, but the same people were super nice, like some of the nicest people I've ever met. And so I had this issue (laughs) where like, they're obviously very religious, very, very nice people, um, seemed happy, had something I didn't have or seemed so. Um, and so then at that point I was like, okay, I'll try church again. Let's, let's see. I'm going to really give it an A, an a plus entry here. And so then I started going to the Catholic church and I, even at one point I was like, I'm going to read the Bible straight through. And so I started at Genesis. <laughs> it didn't go super well. I got to Noah's Ark and I was done. <laughs> um, and, uh, so like, so I was kind of in that and I had stopped, I had stopped going to church Um, I mean, I went like, I don't know, for maybe a couple of months. Um, and you know, there was something like, because I grew up in that environment, there was something comforting about the ritual, but I didn't feel any closer to God. What I felt like was I just, I gave it an effort. Like, I don't see what these other people are seeing. I wish I did. I don't see it. And so, um, this is the point, this is that point when I met Tim actually, So Dawn, um, as you're moving along then, and you're in this uh, very community, you're in this community that's very different than than what you know, how does your story change? I mean, what is it that that makes you want to really reinvestigate seriously this issue of God? There were a series of letters to the editor um, in the local paper about evolution. I don't remember what instigated that exactly, um, but there was a series of letters and then comments um, about those letters. And I was just ashamed. I was ashamed by some of the responses coming from people at the university. And I should note that some of these people were using pseudonyms um, and were behaving very badly. I mean, just unkindly and very badly. And then there's this person, Tim Stratton, who is commenting on a lot of them, but was kind. You know, I, I didn't agree. I didn't agree with anything he said, like, on this. <laughs> uh, but, but he was kind. And he, you know, and was, like, offering, like, anybody that was writing responses, he was offering to meet with them and talk to them in person. Um, and so I had this, like, impression of this person, Tim Stratton, who I didn't know who that was at all. Um that at least, you know, he was kind. You were on an opposite end of those who were at the university. I guess it was on the topic of evolution. Is that what you were talking about? Or I, I think that's right. And intelligent design in general. Um, I was at that point uh, really new to apologetics. I was a youth pastor at that time. And um, I, I saw that many of my students were losing their faith um, or becoming atheists in front of my face because I kind of answered their questions. And so I went on a, a journey to see if there uh, were good answers to their questions. What Don noticed was that I was arguing um, and uh, trying to be nice and respectful and loving at the same time. And I think that got uh, her attention. Um, I do think uh, some of the arguments that I was giving back then were, are horrible and I wouldn't give them anymore. And some of them are still good. Um, but, uh, but, but I like what Don says at the time. She didn't agree with any of them, but she noticed, uh, noticed something in my tone, I guess. Absolutely. I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about the C.S. Lewis Institute. We are living in a day and time when Christianity is being increasingly marginalized and even canceled, when distractions are prevalent, and intentionality towards spiritual growth is curbed. More than ever, we are in need of deeper intentional discipleship as we face challenges in today's world. The C.S. Lewis Institute is here to serve you, 
your study groups, and your church in creating mature disciples who know and live out their biblically grounded faith in Jesus Christ. They provide thoughtful, intelligent resources for individuals, groups, and Bible studies. They provide a year-long fellows program for spiritual growth among like-minded Christians pursuing faith in a serious, structured way. And they host events with respected Christian authors and thinkers to help us understand scripture and the Christian worldview. They also help us engage culture in effective ways. We hope you'll not only take a look at these offerings, but also prayerfully consider donating to this ministry. You can find out more about the C.S. Lewis Institute and give by going to our website at www.cslewisinstitute.org. Now back to our story. You know, that really says something, I think, that even though the content wasn't exactly, perhaps, or anything that she agreed with, she appreciated the way and the manner in which you communicated as particularly juxtaposed to those who, who were her colleagues, who, who weren't putting their very best foot forward. Yeah. So Dawn, his, um, his contribution and his tone, did it, did it uh, cause you to initiate some kind of discussion with him or what, tell yeah. me, tell me what happened after that. It was, um, I think because of these series of articles, my colleague invited someone to come to speak at this was called a science cafe. So it was supposed to be like outreach to the public. And, um, and so, and the topic was on evolution. And so before that, I thought probably Tim would be there and I Googled him. So I knew what he looked like. Really? And so, yeah, I did. <laughs> and so, <laughs> And so I was like on the lookout to, to, to meet him. And my, my only intention was to meet him and tell him I appreciated, um, you know, the tone of his arguments. That, I mean, I just wanted to thank him for that mm-hmm. and to kind of also speak up that we all were not like some of the other people that were, were responding. Um, and so I met him there. And then I think like within the week we had connected on Facebook and I so ran then, into you at Cadoba at the burrito joint. Uh, yeah. Right oh, yeah, after that's that. Right. That's right. We did. We did. Mm-hmm. That's that. exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And so then, and then he or I added the other one as a Facebook friend. And then this started a very long series of messages back and forth. Uh, like, yeah. Um, I don't even know. I think I said at that point, I said, actually, you know, I'm closer to an atheist. And Mm -hmm. so I was like putting all my cards on the table there. And I think like if I go back and look, I bet several times I'm sort of trying to end it saying, thank you so much for your patience. (laughs) Like, (laughs) um, just because like I didn't have any like kind of, I didn't think somebody was going to be able to answer my questions Mm -hmm. when I didn't want to waste his time. But the other thing Mm -hmm. I appreciated Um, very early was that it felt like give and take. So I would not have been as interested in those conversations if it felt like, you know, he was teaching me, but I I wasn't giving back anything in return. Oh, yeah. So I would ask questions, he would ask questions. And so we sort of came to understand each other's beliefs um, that way. So that was kind of the initial part. It was purely intellectual. Mm -hmm. I had no no thought that this was going to lead to some kind of change change in my life. Um, And at one point he said, maybe God put us in each other's paths for this reason. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking like, Oh, (laughs) like this is, that's so nice of him to say, but it's it's just not going to happen. Like, (laughs) so, so Tim, talk with me about Mm -hmm. the way that you were, as, as obviously a thoughtful communicator and really appreciating this conversation you were having with Dawn, what kind of questions or topics or things were you talking, were you just question asking? Uh, were you trying to present some kind of evidence or arguments or how was this conversation proceeding? Yeah, the way I remember it, um, like I said, this was when I first started getting into apologetics. And I think at the time I just enrolled at Biola University, started my master's degree in apologetics. So as I was getting stuff from my classes, I was giving it uh, right to Don. And uh, 
So, you know, I was offering the Kalam cosmological argument and the moral argument and the ontological argument and the fine tuning argument, all, any argument I could get my hands on. As I was learning it, she was basically learning it along with me. Um, and then she was, you know, and I was even trying to argue against evolution at that point, too. Um, and then she asked me if I'd be willing to read some books on it. I'm like, sure. So uh, she gave me some books to read. I remember one in particular from Jerry Coyne, right? And and uh, and I was reading through that. If we're going to be taken seriously, we better understand that which we're, we are arguing against. And I realized that I hadn't done so. And so I really appreciated um, learning about evolution from Don. And I wasn't just going to reject it. Um, I figured if she was willing to listen to me, I better be willing to listen to her. And, and I learned a lot in the process. And while at Biola then, I started thinking about, wow, could an omniscient and omnipotent God create via evolution? And it seemed to me that if God was both omnipotent and omniscient, that he, he could, he, he would have the power to do so and he would know how to do it. And I think you could even relate this to the fine tuning argument, you know, the fine tuning of the initial conditions of the Big Bang or the early universe. And then, you know, so I didn't see a problem there. Not that I necessarily said I, I affirm this view, but I was I kind of had Don in mind. I, I wanted to see, could I come up with a model here for Don's sake? Long story short, I was willing to learn from Don. And I think uh, so being willing to learn from her and to listen to her. Um, and the fact that the tone was good, um, that we were respectful to each other and we weren't like, you stupid idiot. You know, uh, I think those two things um, uh, worked <laughs> in, in favor of us having a really good conversation. And she was then willing to listen to me over a long period of time. I, I felt like almost almost <laughs> daily we'd have some yeah. interaction yeah over Facebook Messenger most of the time and argue. I mean, there's Facebook is bad for tons of reasons, but yeah. I always point to this as a something good that happened because of it. I yeah, no, it was, it was definitely like a very intense time because um, I was really wrestling big issues at that point. Yeah, it sounds, it's, it's curious because it sounds like you started the conversation really not wanting to be convinced, yeah. but there must have been a tipping point at some point where you you actually found the person who was willing to engage in yeah. doubts and questions in a serious way right. and a respectful way. And so it was the first time in your life, I think, that perhaps you, you not only felt safe, I guess, to do that, but also somehow uh, with a renewed interest. It was initially just intellectual. And I mean, and there were some of these arguments that um, I had heard a little bit of because of the class, because of teaching evolution, that sometimes, you know, we do this part where we talk about common objections at the end. And I try to just let students talk and I try not to talk so much. But, so, you know, I needed to understand the objections. And so initially I thought this will be great for that. They'll be able to explain some of these objections that I just don't understand. And so initially, and I had done some work, like I had gotten some books to try and understand that, but I just couldn't quite get it. Um, and so initially, that's what I thought it was going to be, is that he'll help me understand, you know, the opposing arguments. Um, and then that, that'll be great. And that'll be that. Um, but then we started going through the, the argument that convinced me was um, when Tim was developing free thinking, his free thinking argument against naturalism. So it's kind of in the early stages of that. Um, but so we were going through those premises and arguing a lot. And um, at one point, and I mean, like it like blindsided me. I mean, so it was, it was intellectual, intellectual, intellectual. And then one night and I was getting ready to move. So I was, and I wasn't sleeping. Um, so it was like 3 a.m. in the morning and I was packing and I was just thinking, oh, gosh, you know, I, I really think we have free will. Like, I can't be certain. I can't be certain. So that this was one of the things also that I, that would not have worked for me if if not Tim if Tim did not make clear that we don't have to be certain that there's you can have some doubt 
and still and still be convinced. And so I, you know, I was like, I can't be certain about free will. You know, I had tried, I was making myself crazy trying to think of what experiments could we do to show that there's free will and just could not and had read scientific literature, you know, of people trying to show it and, you know, just couldn't, couldn't figure out a way to definitively know. Um, but I had this like revelation that, oh, I think, I think we do have free will. And then the very next thing was, what does that mean? That means there's God. And then it was like, I mean, I, yeah, I, I get a little bit emotional talking about it because it was, like I said, I felt blindsided by it because it was all intellectual until I, until like we had gone through the arguments. So I knew the argument well, I just was stuck on this, you know, I thought either we think we have free will or we do have free will. And I just, I'm like, I can't live my life. I have to live my life with what I think is true. And what I think is true is we have free will. And if we have free will, there's a God. I was just, I mean, I didn't know what to do with that. I was like crazed that night. <laughs> when you have that kind of, that sense of like, this is profound and this is actually true. And perhaps God does exist. I'm sure that's a very sobering moment for you in many ways because you had, for so long, not believed. I mean, really, right. your whole right. life. Tim, for those who don't know the free will argument, or really, that's a novel thing for someone to think about. What do you mean, I don't have free will? Or if I have free will, that means there's a God. Could you, in a nutshell, yeah. just just tell us what that, that is? You bet. So uh, the free thinking argument uh, is an argument that demonstrates uh well, the free thinking argument against naturalism. And it starts out just by saying, if naturalism is true, uh, that the human soul does not exist, right? Because the human soul would be a non-natural or a supernatural, immaterial, non-physical type of thing. So if naturalism is true, the soul does not exist. And then I would say, but if the soul does not exist, then uh, humans do not possess libertarian freedom um, because everything about humanity would be caused and determined by something or someone, or at least by something other than humanity, uh, namely the laws and forces and events of nature. So yeah, if, if the, uh, number one, if the, if naturalism is true, we don't have a soul. Number two, if the soul does not exist, libertarian freedom does not exist. Uh, three, if libertarian freedom does not exist, then, uh, important kinds of rationality and knowledge do not exist. That is, uh, Every time, uh, you know, if something causes causally determines you to affirm a false belief about X, then it's impossible for you to infer a better or true belief about X. And I think that hit Don hard because the goal of the scientist is to infer the best explanation from all the data. But if something else is causally determining her to affirm a false belief about X, then she can't infer the best explanation of the data. She can't do science, right? right. But then the next premise is we can infer uh, better and true beliefs. We can do science. So therefore, you have some conclusions. Therefore, uh, humans possess libertarian freedom. Uh, therefore, uh, the soul or some non-natural aspect of humanity seems to exist. Therefore, naturalism is false. And then I argue that the best, speaking of the best explanation, that the best explanation of all of this data, uh, souls and libertarian freedom, is not just God, but the biblical view of God. And that really starts a new argument. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. So so then, Don, back to you. When you you had this sudden awareness or realization or that you actually believed, <laughs> um, what happened then? Did you call Tim? Did you think, oh, I need to think about this or what next or what kind of God? <laughs> or um, I'm sure I, I wrote to him immediately. Um, and then I think then again, he was still like helping me know what to do. And so he suggested that I start with um, the book of John that I, you know, read and also just like pray, pray to God, which was <clears throat> novel yes notice that i didn't say start with genesis no you did not say start with genesis. <laughs> um, i knew that wasn't going to be good for him. <laughs> um and so so then the next part was kind of um 
so there is a God, you know, is it the Christian God? Right. And so then that was, um, so Tim was at that time teaching a Sunday school class on apologetics. And so I started, I wouldn't go to church, but I would go to that. And so we went through um, Dr. Craig's book on guard, I think, and went through all the arguments there. And then a pivotal moment or time was he showed this um, debate between um, Mike Lacona and Bart Ehrman. And I remember, oh boy, I was rooting for Ehrman. Um, but so he showed this, I just, I mean, cause I just, I don't know what my deal is, dragging my feet every step of the way. Um, but he showed that debate and that was really powerful to me um, because with Lacona, I found a kindred spirit in the, in the sense of being a person that doubts everything, that questions everything. And so, and I really, boy, and so then we talked about it in that class for several weeks and I was trying like everything, like me, maybe, maybe, maybe Paul had epilepsy, maybe like, like, you know, really going through how could this not be true? Um, and so the resurrection that, in general. The resurrection, yeah, yeah, the resurrection, how can that not be true? And, um, and I, again, just, it's not that I was sure, but I was more sure than not. So like, you know, I was, I don't know what we, we, Tim and I would often talk about percentage, how percent, what percentage <laughs> sure are you? And so I was above 50% sure. I don't know, like, you know, how high, mm -hmm. but, but the idea was that that's the thing that I thought was true, whether I was a hundred percent convinced or not, you know, that's the way I needed to live my life at that point. So that, I think that was like in the spring. So when we first started talking in the fall of 2012, I think, and then in the spring was when I was going through the classes with him. And then we watched the debate during that time. And I still wasn't calling myself a Christian um, yet. Um, and then um, I had, I had a question. Yeah. I had, I, I had a question uh, um, to Tim about, the resurrection like why like why did jesus have to die it didn't make sense to me that there wouldn't be some other way and then he gave a sermon at church about that and so then after that sermon then i started calling myself a christian okay that was like the final thing that i needed answered that is a really tremendous question and i think it it's a it's really a stumbling block for many people why did jesus have to die um um, I don't know if you want to give a little 60 second response to that. Basically, it had to do with how our broken relationships restored. Um, what does the offended party have to do? What yeah, does the offending right. party have to do? And really cash that out and connected a whole bunch of logical dots. And I think, yeah, I think you can make a pretty good case that, wow, this is why the creator of the universe had to enter into the universe uh, to, to die for those who he loved within the universe. I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about a wonderful way for you to take a closer, more intentional look at an important area of your life that's often neglected. When a new year rolls around, we often consider many areas in need of attention in our lives and we set new personal goals. Every year, many of us will go through a physical checkup or a performance review at our workplace. But how often do we take time to review our spiritual life? The C.S. Lewis Institute Annual Spiritual Checkup is designed to help you take a closer look at your spiritual life over the past year and to prayerfully seek God's help in areas where you sense He desires you to grow in the new year. There are strategic questions, articles, and video talks that are designed to help you think through pivotal spiritual areas in your own life. I hope you'll take a look at this complimentary resource. You can access the C.S. Lewis Spiritual Checkup at the Institute website by typing in www.cslewisinstitute.org forward slash ASC. Now back to our story. You know, as, the, as we are going on, it just strikes me how perfectly 
God placed you, Tim, in Don's life as someone who is incredibly logical and analytical. And you obviously are made from the same cloth. Mm-hmm. And you're able to think through things in such a way. You don't just say, believe. You know, why don't you right. just believe? That's um, what I used to do. As, yeah. as a former youth pastor and yeah. a bad youth pastor, that's what I did. Yeah. And I realized that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because for especially the skeptic. Right. You know, they they just don't take things, you know, just because you throw them out. They yeah. you have to have a good reason. And it sounded mm-hmm. like it sounds like you were the perfect person in her life who not only knew you, it's not that you knew all the answers, but you're willing to look and engage and learn alongside um and you're both searching for truth, but in a very deep, logical and analytical way and there's something to be said for that. It's really a beautiful thing. Um, so you came to a place not only that you believed intellectually, Don, um, that there, that God exists, and obviously you were convinced at some point that Jesus rose from the dead, and perhaps that verified the claims that He too was God. Um, but that it was more than an intellectual assent; it was something that you, someone, to whom you gave your life. Um, and and affiliated, and you were willing to put on that label of Christian. Um, that was a tremendous change. Um, you talk with me about that, and and the change that has come in your life as a result of of really becoming a Christ follower. Yeah. So um, this is the harder part to talk about for me. Um, I think it was partially because of my personality and also because of my job. I was not super excited to, to use the term at all. Um, and, and just the other part that was difficult, well, difficult about what does this mean was that I'm not sure my family are believers hmm. and most of my friends are not believers. And so there was, you know, at one point that I, I mean, I was disturbed. I was distressed by my conclusion. So it wasn't, you know, like all rainbows. <laughs> I mean, I, I felt, I, yeah, I felt pretty bad about it for a while. Um, like people, like you, you had said, for me, it wasn't enough just to say believe. It seems like for plenty of people it is. Um, but for me, you know, I needed more and God gave me more. You know, so there's so many gifts that I've been given that I don't often feel like I do enough with those gifts. Um, But in terms of like how it's changed my life, I wouldn't even be thinking like this. You know, I would just like, I would let's like rewind to when I was saying one foot in front of the other. It's not, you know, I always tried to be a kind person, but there's a different obligation to that you know, to, to helping others and like living your life for more than just yourself. And that's, um, yeah, it just changes though. I don't know if my actions, if it it has changed my actions as much as the mindset of why I do things or why I try, what things I try to keep in mind as I live my life. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an ongoing process for all of us, Dawn, Mm -hmm. isn't it? I mean, Every day is a gift, even, and yeah. um, every every time is a gift, and and what we do with that, it's a struggle for us all. I, I'm I'm imagining that there are our listeners who are curious about your perspective too. It may be very much like Tim's in terms of what would you say to the person who doesn't understand how science and faith can go together. Um, they look at you, you're a PhD in evolutionary biology or molecular evolution or, and, but, but yet you call yourself a Christian, a believer in God. How do you reconcile those or put those together? Is there a problem at all? Um, I don't think there's a problem at all. (laughs) Um, I, I think, I mean, I separated out, you know, with like, and I teach my students this, that in science, we, uh, we use methodological naturalism um, such that, you know, by definition, we're studying the natural world. Biology is a study of life. So what's outside of the natural world isn't in science. 
like and not that there's no influence of supernatural but that just by definition the rules of science are we do not include that you know so if i'm in the lab and i'm doing an experiment and i can't figure out why we can't jump to like the supernatural influence we wouldn't make progress you know and it, it's separate from whether or not you think there is separate whether or not you think there is supernatural influence um supernatural influence um you can believe that there is and still not take it into account because the process of you know we have a process that we use to to make progress um and so for me i just not that they don't intersect but the way that you know i look at science or the way i do my job it doesn't come into it you know i'm trying to be objective as objective as possible making the inference to the best explanation i mean in my life every single thing i do i try to make you make the inference to the best explanation and so i don't and i've never really seen the problem um and i'm i think also because i'm a scientist i'm pretty used to um ideas changing with more information and so i don't get hung up on that and and i think it's arrogant to think that we will figure all this out so i mean either as you know on either end that we'll know god's mind or that as a scientist i'm going to be able to recreate what happened billions of years ago i mean it's it's arrogant to think we're ever going to reach that step but if you have a possibility that should give you reason to to believe that reconciliation is possible mm -hmm. And I think Don's exactly right. That when she's going into the lab, she's, uh, for lack of maybe a better term, assuming methodological naturalism. Yeah. She's not looking for supernatural right. everywhere, right. even right. though she believes in God and that right. God created the universe right. and everything. I mean, right. the, the, uh, Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says, day after day, your creation pours forth speech. Yeah. Night after yeah. night, it delivers knowledge. So yeah. God's word is telling us study yeah. nature. Yeah. Do yeah. science, right? That's what the Bible is saying. Do science, study what God has created. So if you study the nature that God has created, uh, there's no more, uh, it's not necessary to look for all the, you know, how, what's the term that you like to use? Uh, the tinkering, the tinkering, yeah. Yeah, the tinkering yeah. God or, or whatever. No need to look yeah. for that once you as, uh, affirm that he already created it supernaturally. So, yeah. And I think like, and actually that's the other thing is that I think that's one, one of God's greatest gifts. I mean, and to me personally, but to humanity in general is that he allows us to figure some of this out. We get a glimpse you know, we can use our brains and he gives us enough resources to be able to make inferences to the best explanation and understand how he created. I mean, I just like that's and that's the part where that's the part where kind of faith comes into my work. That part is that I'll just be blown away just at what we're able to figure out. You know, it didn't have to be that way. We didn't have to have these tools um, to be able to make inferences. And I mean, he gave us this gift. That's right. All the more reason to really appreciate that um, free thinking argument, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you have to have a grounded rationality before you can observe in a predictable rational universe and right. all of that. So it all comes together. Um, as we're wrapping up, I think I would like to hear really from both of you in terms of advice that you would give to someone like yourself, Don, who was, is just a skeptic at heart, um, someone who really is looking for truth and wants to have valid reason and rationality for their belief. They want to have grounded, warranted belief. Um, what would you say or how would you advise someone like yourself or who might be searching with that kind of intentionality and thoughtfulness I mean, I think one of the one of the things that helped me a lot early is when I came to that conclusion exactly that I'm just looking for truth. I don't have, I mean, you know, whatever way it goes is what I'm going to believe. I don't have to be invested in there not being a God or there being a God. I can just simply say, I'm looking for evidence and I'm going to come to the conclusion that makes most sense to me. And so that takes a lot of pressure off and takes a lot of emotion out of it, which I think often 
um, is a hang up for that. So, I mean, if you have the idea in your head that you're just looking for the truth and that you'll, you'll, you and also, you know, you don't have to, you can think for yourself. So maybe you really admire one person, but that person, you know, you know there's parts of it, parts of the belief, arguments you don't like. Well, you don't have to, you, it doesn't have to be the whole thing or nothing, you know? So you yeah. can look for, you can look for pieces of evidence all over. I tell Tim this all the time, that there's all of these arguments for existence of God. I think about three of them are good. So I mean, like, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not an easy sell and I'm not convinced, but I don't care if there's a hundred, if there's one that is convincing to me, then well, I, you need- I go with that. Anything you would add as an advice to the skeptic, Tim, and uh, anything you would encourage them? To the skeptic, I'd, I'd say really evaluate your, your life and even in your innermost being and your subconscious thoughts, even if, it's, if you can. Are you resisting uh, the, the Holy Spirit? Are you resisting uh, the arguments? Um, are, are you resisting? I, I know many people who have said, look, I, I want God to exist. I don't want it. Uh, you know, I, I don't want atheism to be true. But then when you start arguing with them, even in a polite way, they get very emotional and defensive. And it seems clear to me, well, you are uh, not a non-resistant non-believer. And Dawn seemed to me to get to the point where uh, at least I thought she is a she is definitely a non-resistant non-believer. And if that's the case, and she was going to be open um, sometimes more than others. Yeah, she is the most skeptical person I've ever met to this day, no matter what we're talking about. Skeptical. And I think it's a, a gift, though. Uh, um, and sometimes maybe I'm too optimistic. And so her pushing back on, on my optimism with a little bit of skepticism is good. And I think, you know, we've been able to meet in the middle on on so many things. Um and, and so then I would just say to those who are having conversations with skeptics or non-believers in general, don't wipe the dust off your feet too quickly. I see too many Christians just say, uh, well, I had a conversation with them once and I'm wiping the dust off of my feet and walking away, you know, to quote scripture. Um, I d- I'm aware I just last week uh, was with somebody who led his friend to Christ after 30 years of sharing the gospel and doing apologetics with them, 30 years, uh, this man finally accepted uh, the truth and accepted the evidence, followed the evidence where it was leading and gave his life to Christ. And Don, I felt like our conversation was a long time, but it wasn't close to 30 years. I, don't, I mean, it was several years, though, um, right? The, the the bulk of it was a year. Okay. Like, I mean, we, we, like, I had questions for a long, long time after that. Right, so, I right, mean, right. it was several years, mm-hmm. but the, from, like, agnostic leaning atheist to Christian was, like, right around a year. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, but, like, hundreds of pages of text. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that needs to become a book. Yeah. We, we have it. We have it. <laughs> 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 we might have to publish that. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to edit it. That's for sure. Edit sure. it for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's some things I'm sure I, I said back then that I would be ashamed of. Now, yeah. But, just to, but, but God yeah. even, yeah, I'm sure God can use imperfect arguments <laughs> um, uh, times too. So yeah. Yeah. Well, just keep having the conversation. Yeah. And, and love each other and respect yeah. each other and don't be jerks. I think, yeah. um, and even some of Don's colleagues, uh, you know, one, one guy in particular, we used to, you know, we used to probably hate each other. Um, uh, and But now we've even kind of developed a, a friendship with each other. We stop being jerks to each other and are able to have these conversations. And so, uh, yeah, just have fun conversations. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, trust God with it. But you, you gain friends and uh, develop critical thinking skills in the process. For me, it strengthened. You know, Don came to faith in Christ. My faith in Christ was strengthened, and it seemed to expand. I saw a bigger view of our maximally great being um, through the process as well. So that's, a, that's wonderful, wonderful advice both ways, both to skeptics and to Christians, Tim. Um, and finally. Dawn, if you were to talk to the Christian, especially 
with the example that Tim was in your life, you know, patient, kind, diligent, very thoughtful and intelligent, meeting you where you were, open, all of those things, how would you advise the Christian to engage with uh, the non-believer, the not maybe perhaps the non-resistant non-believer? <laughs> That may not be non-resistant. Or that may or may not be resistant, I guess. I mean, the the biggest thing, I guess, was just um, to show humility and to show, like, you don't have to be sure, you know, and, and that you can learn from each other, you know, that not to, I don't know, think less of a person that has doubts um, and to, you know, make them feel like that, like the doubting part is okay. Oh, that's that was huge that that I knew it was okay to doubt and that I didn't I mean if if he would have said at some point you're gonna be a hundred percent certain I would have said okay we're done you know that like this idea that certainty isn't the goal I mean we're not trying to be certain we're trying to have a relationship it's not it's relationship with God it's not it's not about being a hundred percent certain. Um, and so those were the huge things and just, yeah, to be kind, I mean, that it shouldn't be so hard, but that's, you know, think, think the best you can of the mm. other person. Yeah. I've, I've heard, uh, this is actually wisdom from my husband that there, that we have a hermeneutic of either trust or suspicion mm. towards the other. And I think to your point, um, I think that we do need to, to trust really that the other person is coming from a good place until they, you know, demonstrate they otherwise. Right. Yeah. It's kind of innocent until proven guilty right. Uh, right. because we, we really do want the best for the other. I mean, that re- that's what love is. And some of that's just being patient and it's, and it's giving the benefit of the doubt. So, wow, what an amazing story this is and how rich it has been to have both of you in the conversation today to 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 give life to your story, Dawn and to Tim to just to bring such insight and wisdom and you know how you walked alongside both of you. you know you're walking together in this process and and I think that's what that humility and that that respect, mutual respect really stands out a lot. So thank you so much for, uh, again, your time and just coming forward and telling your story. Like you said, it's not an easy thing to do necessarily, especially as a professional, as an evolutionary biologist and and someone in the academic world. So I applaud you, Dawn. Um, This is, it's it's courageous. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right. And thank you, Tim, of course. Um, My pleasure. Yes. Thanks for tuning into the Side B Podcast to hear Dawn Simon's story. You can find out more about Dawn and Tim Stratton, as well as their recommended resources in our episode notes. For questions and feedback about this episode, you can reach me by email at the Side B Podcast at the C.S. Lewis Institute dot org. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll follow and share this podcast with your friends and that you'll rate and review it as well. In the meantime, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next time where we'll see how another skeptic flips the record of their life.